that's where they want to be to when they start raising brood. Anyway, so Italian bees, uh, often you'll, you'll see that the cluster will freeze and, and starve just two or three inches away from capped honey because they can't break that cluster in the winter. So um, uh, top waters uh, get uh, bad mouthed a bit because a lot of them die, but mo because mostly people are getting these packaged bees from Georgia, shake them into the top bars, and a lot of those bees just don't make it no matter what box you put them in. But uh, I see that they, they winter for me as well or better than my Langstroth hives. I don't know if, they, if I just send them more love or what. I do wrap them. I, I uh, put some dry leaves in a trash bag and lay that on top for a little extra insulation. I really think insulation benefits the bees, especially on the top surface. I mean, the honey inside the hive serves as their insulation. Honey has an R factor of like 17, or something like that. Yeah, the one, uh, wood is like one to two. But this top surface, you don't want that to be a cold surface because then the moisture will condense and drip back down on the bees. So wrapping them like this in about October or November or so, I think is a good deal. And the wild hives I've seen, bottom line is that they seem all to be very well insulated. And a lot of them have very little ventilation in wild bees. They tend to have very small, tiny entrances. I think that the more insulation you have around your hive, the less ventilation you need, the less moisture problems you have, and the, the less active the hives have to be to, to move the water out. And uh, also you've got to put on mouse screens on any kind of hive, because once it starts getting too cold, the, the mice will move in, it's a warm, dry spot, and there's already food there. So uh, I use half-inch hardware cloth, and any hole that's a half-inch or bigger, a, a mouse can go into. So uh, you can see by my basic setup of the top bars, I've got like, cinder blocks as the stand, and on top of the thing I have a, a sheet of masonite or plywood or whatever you can get, <laughs> you know? Just go out into your local dumpsters and you can build all kinds of beehives and from half of those. Uh, in the summer, I will take one of these bars or two of these bars and prop up that lid so they get a little airflow so they don't get too hot. But that cover is just to keep the direct sun and the, the rain off of the, uh, of the top bars. This is one of my yards up in New York. It's a south-facing slope, full sun. I really recommend full sun for your bees because once they start rearing brood, you know, it's 92, 93 degrees in there. The warmer the hive can be, the more bees can go out and forage and less have to stay home. So protect from the wind is, is really ideal to get the hives through the winter as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's some disadvantages of top bar hives, and I get lots of calls every year. Oh, my bees are going crazy in there. I can't inspect it anymore. If anything, you know, you have to look at top bar hives more often than other kinds of hives that use foundation. Because, you know, people call me every year or email me and say, oh, this seems like the most natural way to go. Not really. <laughs> because if you want to keep the hive straight on these bars, they will tend to stay straight, straight, straight in their brood area. But once they start getting to their honey storage area towards the back, I've seen wild hives that have honeycombs that are four inches wide. So big slabs of honey like that. And so they can use less wax and just store lots of honey. And we have very intense honey folks up here in the north that all happen very fast. So they'll go straight, straight, straight. But then they'll start to curve ed an edge a little bit. And the next one will curve a little bit more. Before you know it, they're like building a comb across three or four bars at once, and you're not going to be able to get it back apart. So, the way to pre prevent that from happening is get in there every 10 days in the spring when they're making lots of wax. And so, this can be a hands on pot. I mean, that's how you want to learn bees anyway. Get in there a little bit, see what, see what happens. Get stung, you know. If you don't get stung, then you're not doing it. If you're not making mistakes, then you're not but you're being active or so get in there and try to see, see the edges and keep them kind of straight, bend them back. Then once they start making these wider cones, I use spacer strips like this that are about a quarter inch or so. I've got a spacer strip at the front here between the first cone and the divider to keep proper bee space and then the last cone and the divider. But I have extra of these. Once they start making wider cones, I can put them in between the two top bars and keep the cones somewhat centered. But it takes some finagling and it takes some inspections to be in there to uh, keep them straight. That's the main disadvantage of the top bar hives. I, I worked myself up to about 350 top bar hives and I just couldn't keep up with them to keep them straight. There's nothing wrong with crazy comb in there, you know? Um, 
because you can just like smoke the bees away and harvest the honey out of the back, no problem. But if that's uh, I mean, the way you're going to do it, you might as well just have a hollow log. You know? So to keep the hive legal and legally inspectable, um, you want to be able to be there to keep the, the combs straight. And also, I sell top bar nukes, so I need to have those straight combs. And really, if you want to boost this hive for honey production, you want to stir them up a little bit. Um, because when your hive expands in the spring, you know, they'll grow, grow, grow. If they hit a wall of honey right here, they can start to feel congested. You can add all the empty space in the world here, but if they hit a, a wall of honey when they're trying to expand, they can feel honey bound and swarm earlier. Whereas if you mix them up a little bit, you take an empty bar and put it between two of the drawn combs. I tend not to divide up the brood nest so much because we have cold nights and stuff, but probably right at the side of the brood nest, I'll put an empty bar so they got an area that they can work in. And by that stirring them up, it's kind of like a benign agitation. Think of like gardening, you know, you're stirring up the soil for the plants to go deeper. And the, the line straw hive does, it works off of that same principle when you throw a super on top. You know, because that is the warmest part of the hive. The bees want to work really hard to get back up into that warm area. So you're tricking the bees and, and at the right time of year, it really pays off and they can make a lot of honey. But that, dropping that empty bar in between two draw combs is the same kind of thing as throwing a super on top of a line straw hive. So I've, I've experimented with some other hive designs that can be much more hands-off, this do-nothing beekeeping that I'm interested in. And uh, Abby Boré's book uh, came out about three years ago. It was translated from the French. Boré was a French beekeeper. He came out with this book, Beekeeping for All, in the 1940s. And it's a free download. You can find it on biobees.com. You just look for Boré, W-A-R-R-E. And it's pretty much the only book that I have found post Langstroth that actually promotes bees swarming. Um, it's rare to find anything like that that uh, lets bees be bees. But his approach, he, he, he designed this hive that was about 12 by 12 inches. And I have one of them uh, right here. Love that one. Props. Okay. Here this one. So this box is about 12 by 12 inches. And he was building them about eight or nine inches deep. I decided eventually to make them a little shallower, but my first year I did this, um, I guess two years ago now, I started making them out of 10 inches deep, and I didn't put anything in there. I just made it a hollow tree. I mean, I don't have the inspectors up in New York anymore. The state's broke. We all just do whatever we want to. But I know I could, I know I could take a wire and cut this thing apart and put it back together if I was forced to inspect it. But that's not the idea with the Warre hive. You know, the brood nest is sacred. You never mess with them. You let them swarm. Really, you can go see the bees twice a year. In the spring, you throw empty boxes underneath the whole hive. And the bees work down. Their entrance is towards the bottom, so they shuffle their brood nest down and put their honey up top. In the fall, you come with a wire, and you cut off this top box and harvest the honey. You're also harvesting the oldest comb when you harvest that honey. So the brood nest is always working into the youngest comb. The, the, so that brood comb is automatically renewed into the newest wax. But it's totally hands off, and you can just do everything in the spring, harvest your honey, in. and you can uh, split them by just cutting them in, hot, in half and, and rotating them around. Uh, I simplified his, his design a little bit. Uh, he had a quilt, he had a box of sawdust that he put on top that actually wicked out the moisture. I'm just doing a uh, solid wooden slab, and then my top is an 18 by 18 inch tile, which will last forever. That's my favorite part of it. And my entrance is just like a, some shims shoved between the boxes to make a gap towards the bottom. But I decided to make the boxes a little bit shallower so I could run them also as mating nukes. So I make them six inches deep, and when they're six inches deep, I can stack them on top of each other. I give them a screen bottom and a little bit dead air, dead air space in between them. And stacked up, I can put three or four of these nukes stacked on top of each other with an entrance facing each direction. So this is an example on that. The combs are really tiny and cute. I do a lot of beekeeping boot camps with brand new beekeepers. I can give them each their own little war a nuke, and they can find their first queen. They don't have to bend over, and they're really mellow and easy to work. It's a, they're a lot of fun, you know? And then I can do my intensive beekeeping. These I can drop in queen cells. They fill up that box really quickly. Every two or three weeks, I have to split them off and just propagate these really quickly. Then when I want them to grow up, I can just pull that screen out of the bottom and then start to work down. 
so they can reach that critical mass they need to serve. It means throughout the whole summer, then in the fall, pull that screen out and just combine two of them so they reach that critical mass they need to survive. So um, these have been really fun, and like at, at both the intensive beekeeping and queen raising standpoint, but also the leave alone hives that I hear every other year or not at all. And I also hang up the bait hives out there. It's that issue, and it's been working. Shots here from our, our treatment free conference in Maine every year. It's we do a lot of hands on. I usually we uh, produce some packages and all these alternative hive designs. This is uh, Tim O'Neill from Burrow Bees. But we have this whole community of beekeepers who are like. These folks are known, and I, I like to do as much outreach as being interested in building a bee empire. <laughs> I'd much rather teach people how to fish than see every year when I sell my bees, I feel like I'm selling my children. To get their own five, six hives in their backyard. <laughs> you know? Anti-expansion. You know, six hives fishing pole and the network of six or more hives, it's uh, much less likely that you're going to lose those. You can revere. You might have an extra hive or have to rely on the failing bee industry anymore. So. So I'm trying to go fishing and hunting for a few months. <laughs> so I don't feel that we have all this community that we're growing won't beekeeper anymore. It's pretty great to see. I go to a lot of beekeeping conferences. I'm the youngest one there by 20 years, but that's a with a lot of uh, young people. It's fantastic. Bigger the interest grows every year. So does anyone see that? beekeeping in New York there? Besides all the toxins and heavy metals, that, that there's not a lot of forage for this amount of hives. So I've seen in Philadelphia, it seem to do really well. So I've got friends that keep these at, at some of my hives at Bartram's Gardens and stuff, and Mill Creek Farm in West Philly. So they thrive. But New York City, um, I, I do send some bees down there every year, but uh, this hive specifically is used uh, medicinally in an acupuncture practice. And really, I, I screen my customers, and if they're going for educational purposes, I mean, there are some top our hives on top of the Bowery Poetry Club and things like that. For education and medical practices, it, it's a pretty neat, neat deal. Because, I mean, beekeeping really creates this sense of awareness, you know? You know I mean, once people start keeping bees, their whole attitude towards their environment changes, and it uh, really creates a renaissance. But this is what ends up happening. This is in downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> Not one, one person in this picture is a beekeeper, but, uh, they sent me this photo later, but after they had called me, and I, I, I talked them through catching this swarm. And then they stuck around, and they're all beekeepers now, which is pretty neat. But, but a swarm in New York City is not good PR for us. That, not at this point. We're, trying, we're doing lots and lots of education to change it. Over in Europe, if a, a swarm lands on the street, they, they have a block party. It's a, it's a time to celebrate, you know? Not so much here in this country yet. But again, a way to avoid this happening is set up your bait hubs. Because a lot of these swarms go out and they just meet the spray camp. They're all killed. And these are like very healthy overwintered bees, too. So if you set up a bait hive, even if you don't want to keep bees, and you catch a passing swarm, you might be saving that swarm from meeting a, a little demise. So uh, I recommend that everyone puts up bait hives in their, in their backyard. It's, a, it's pretty neat. The bees might choose you. So, and uh, also one thing I do is get bees out of buildings. So that's job security. When uh, all these new beekeepers, you know, they go in, get their first sting, they get a little gun shy, their hives run out of room, and all these swarms go out. But I'll go and get them, and I've, been, I've picked up some really uh, great bee families this way. And these are very, very healthy hives. There's, there's a history of uh, beekeeping in America that blames wild hives as uh, the source of disease, as the cesspool. And it's anything but that. I mean, these bees aren't spreading the mites around or, or the toxic uh, or the, the, the pathogens that we see. And this history even is, is very recently, just in two years ago, when varroa mites first made it to uh, the big island of Hawaii. They tried to, to aerial spray the bees around the Hilo airport. Uh, they aerial sprayed fipronil and tried to kill them all to prevent the spread of this mite. And of course it didn't work, you know? It's like uh, cutting down all the American chestnut trees when the blight started coming in. You know, so they're all going to die anyway, cut them all down, and then we start to find some that are a little bit resistant to the blight, but too late. Mm -hmm. But I'll go in and I'll uh, cut out the brood and I'll rubber band it into frames, or I mean, top bar frames and rubber band them into those. And then you leave the box there till night, ideally you find the queen. And uh, I use a bee vacuum too, which is just a, I use a little five gallon bucket with a little dust buster attached to the bottom. And one of those strainer bags, which is a great universal tool, with a tube that catches the bees in the strainer bag. And so a bee vacuum is a good thing to have. And 
if you keep bees for a while, and people start knowing that, eventually you're going to get called about some bees in somebody's wall that you asked to remove. Um, but you got to cut open the whole wall. And the first thing I tell people is I'm a beekeeper, not a carpenter. I'm not putting it back together. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it's rare to find like really well-established hives up north, but they are out there. Down south in Florida, I can do a bee removal every day. They just swarm at all times of year, and we have all these foreclosed buildings that are rotting. It's like an ideal wild bee environment. And those bees are very, very gentle in Florida, so if they're Africanized or not, I mean, I don't care. They're really sweet bees to work with. I don't release them to the public. I, I keep an eye on them, but uh, I've never had any problems with those bees. And often I don't even wear a veil. This is down in Florida. This is pretty much how I go. That's how I roll. So, we get a lot of clay pots <laughs> down, and down in Florida. And these are my favorite removables by far. I show up at twilight, put the flower pot in the back of my truck, and ask them if they want the, the flower pot back. I say, no, you keep it. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is um, an example of what not to do. These people tried to make a, a screen funnel and put up a box there to try to get the hive coerced out into the box. And that, that rarely works. If anything, if you give them a frame of eggs, they might make a new queen on the outside, of, on the outside box, but the old queen will never leave to come out into the light. And these bees had found a new entrance up, up to the, the, the upper right corner. And I started cutting up in, uh, into their original entrance, and I didn't see them. So I started cutting into their new entrance, and I still didn't see them. This is what it ended up looking like. This is, uh, yeah, the, the homeowner was, was very understanding. Once <laughs> <laughs> a while, I, I'm removing a hive from a wall, and I'm thinking, you know, these kind of look like my bees. You know? <laughs> I still charge for them anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, did, I actually did find them, like, way up top, towards the end of the stud that I had originally cut into, but uh, that was a bit tough one. But, um, this is one I did in 2010 up in Dutchess County. This was a big hut, one of the biggest ones that I, I had seen. And the landowner said they've been there at least for 15 years, as long as they've been there. This thing was about two and a half feet wide and about eight feet tall. Probably 70 or 80,000 bees. I put them up over any domestic hive I, I've seen. About 120 pounds of honey. And I was humble in front of these, this hive. These are like the bees of my dreams. I didn't wear a veil from this removal. I found the queen. She was like a brown, leather, leatherback color. And I put them in, into some boxes and, and brought them to a bee yard in, in upstate New York, in Dutchess County there. And they wintered really well that first winter. The next spring, I started raising lots of queens off of them. So this has become a really good family in my strains. They are fantastic. So, I, I do recommend going in to do some bee removals. If it's, a, it's an ambitious undertaking, explain the ropes so I'm gonna, as, before you, have, you can make your cuts. But a lot of people want to save the bees these days, and we will help you out. You know, I do a few up here in, in the north, but down south, you know, up north I sell bees and sell honey. Down south, I get paid to get more bees and more honey. It's like, it feels like a scam. So this is, this is peewee. Um, this is the only hive I have right now that has a name. Peavy was a swarm a couple of years ago now that I shipped into a wicker basket in the shape of a peanut. And they filled up and I put that on top of a hollow log and that on top of a square box and on top I put a towel and a tile. This is a bee inspector's nightmare. <laughs> We're walking to a bee yard to see this thing. But, you know, since I, I've like, worked a lot with wild hives, I know I can take wires and cut apart peewee, and I can inspect the brood, and with some support sticks, I can put it back together if I had to. Not easily inspectable by any means, but it can be done. But the same idea, you can throw some boxes underneath, and I haven't harvested uh, any honey from peewee. I just don't have the heart to cut off the, the head. <laughs> but I did catch the swarm from them this year, and they've survived for three years now, with no wrapping or any, anything. <laughs> so. Um, I still don't really know why I did this, <laughs> but I'm showing it to you now because I like making the point that beekeeping is not really a rational endeavor. And my, at this point, my, my thinking is no longer linear by any means. I hang out with insects all day long. And, uh, but, you know, bees aren't rational. 
creatures. You know, humans aren't rational. Love is not rational. Only robots are rational. And in changing my beekeeping, I knew I didn't want to live like a robot, and I didn't want to run bees like machines, because machines break down all the time. So I've been able to find out some methods that work for me with minimal inputs, and I've been building a business out of it, and when the weather's good, things are really good, but totally self-sustaining. You know, every year I get all the bee catalogs in the mail, I leaf through every page, and I say, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that. So, but like I said, my heart's in, in doing education and outreach, and out front, if you didn't grab one already, is this year's Anarchy Apiary's Almanac, the Beekeeping Survival Guide. So if you pick one up, that comes with a, a condition. <laughs> I would ask if uh, you, you grab one here today, uh, if you could make two copies of that and forward that to aspiring beekeepers and tell them to do the same, and this thing would go viral. It's got some of the basics of, uh, you know, things you might want to know to keep your hive alive. I got a picture of my bee vacuum there. I've got how to make a skep, you know, those, illegal, those nice illegal beehives. Because I think about, you know, what, what's the beekeeping going to look like a hundred years from now? It's going to be a lot simpler, a lot more feasible, a lot easier to get into. And I really, at my heart, I, I think that it's, we're going to go back to letting the bees swarm and catching swarms and letting them have the say because the way that the industrial beekeeping has been going is not looking good. But us, you know, us in this room, we're the future of these small time producers. Rather than bee consumers, we can be producers. And it's, uh, it's just going to propagate from there, you know. Our, our, our beekeepers and our bees are just getting stronger every day. So it's pretty exciting times to be into it. So um, I think I got a little bit of time left. I can, uh, I can sing you some bee songs. <laughs> yeah. given to be my brother Adam at, at Buckfast Abbey, you know, the legendary bee breeder. Okay, this was his, and he gave it. That's not true. <laughs> I said that at a bee talk once, and then somebody raised a question, is that your only brother? <laughs> Hmm. 
insects here. You gotta get used to it up here with all these insects here. Yep. There's all these insects here. All these insects here. And we shall have no fear of all these insects here.
two. Last three numbers. Six, seven, two. I got it.
<laughs> there is a woman in that movie who reaches into the trunk of a tree and pulls out a huge glob of wax and honey and carries it to her girlfriend who's sitting about 30 feet away. She has bees all over her face and her hair and her arms and everything. And I've always wondered if that was really for real or if they did it some special way. <laughs> soil, a soil below 7, we want to try and bring it more towards neutral. And the question I had was, do you not have a problem with breeding hive beetles in basic soils? And how do you know how much lime and diatomaceous earth to, to put in? Uh, uh, I, now, I'm hard of hearing, and that's from the driving the truck. So the last, uh, the last part I got, but the other question I didn't hear. Uh, I, the, I guess the last, the, the first question was, do you, are there problems with hive beetles breeding in soils that are basic? Uh, when, when you take and put that line down, uh, the hive beetles don't seem to breed in it. Uh, we have people that are, will take, take uh, down our way, they have a lot of limestone, and that's used to adjust the pH in the soil. And they put uh, crushed limestone down underneath their hive. And the people that do that do not have trouble with hive beetles because the parents are being fierce with the pupae uh, of the, the hive beetle. So it would be a good thing to do. When we use diatomaceous earth, uh, we spread it out and do it about four times a year. And then we take in um, water it in or do it right before rain. That way it doesn't have any volunteered to look at soil pH and see if there was a if there was a moment, a pH moment where high beetles aren't going to be breeding there. I think that was that's a great contribution. No, we'll Thank try you. That. that was a good idea that you come up with to take in this spring or this, this year we're going to take uh, about six hives and play with the pH under each hive. And of course they'll be separated and uh, keep monitoring that find out where that uh, air threshold is to stop the reproduction of my uh, high beetles. And so that's something we're going to try to the point. And, and I'm all about the playing with the uh, bees. I always was told that you couldn't overwinter a bees in the new. And that didn't make sense to me. And, and so we, we took some little nukes. So one fine frame do got it through the winter, why no trouble? And took a kind of two five frame nuke, and then a three five and a four. And as a result of doing it that way, my dad, he's in his 80s, late 80s, and he's able now to have his own little bees to play with them because he can manage five frames. You know? And uh, so you can take and 
area, they can get up to about March in a five grain loop. And if we have warm days, they'll start consuming a lot of their stores and they will, they just can't make it. So we have to have two five grain loops to get them through the winter if you want to raise them strictly in the middle in our area. Talking about high beetle, that I've seen really devastating losses in commercial outfits down south. And uh, up north, it seems that the soil temps are below 70 degrees. It takes a lot longer for the beetles to pupate. So, I mean, down south, I mean, it was pretty common years ago to roll a hive on the bottom where you see 400 of these beetles scattered. Really devastating. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of hives. And what is even worse is some of the chemical controls that the commercial beekeepers use to try to eliminate the beetles. A lot of them don't work. But I've seen the, the bees changing a lot in the last several years to cope with beetles. I've actually watched the, the highs at twilight, and the bees will actually intercept the beetles in midair and bounce them away like scud missiles, you know? <laughs> and um, I did uh, some workshops for uh, Western Agricultural Society in Hawaii this year where beetles have just arrived in the past year called massive, massive losses. And the bees there aren't really recognizing the beetles. They're just starting to be aware of them. A beetle will run by, and the bees will just perk up a little bit and then go back to doing what they're doing. Whereas meanwhile, here on the mainland, bees have learned that they attack the beetles, try to sting them, they ground them in the corners, make little propolis prisons for them. And this past year, I've actually seen a lot of bees that are now flipping the beetles over, grabbing them by the, leg, the legs, and flying off with them. <laughs> so this is, there's a genetic factor in having strong bees. But I keep my hives in full sun, like all day long full sun. And in the top of our hive, you can always condense down the, the area of where the hive is. If the bees are ever not covering the cones, you can just remove those cones and get it so the bees are always covering their surface area. And that seems to help. So there's a lot of things, but I mean, beetles are. You know, I don't want good terms with Varroa mites, you know. Varroa has taught me a lot. I think they're making the bees stronger. I've had the opportunities I've had because of Varroa, really. So, I mean, and basically, I mean, they're, they're going to be a secondary pest where the bees have just better forage. It's not the end all. We're gonna, we have an Asian mite, Tropolelops, that's going to come next, you know. So I'm on good terms with Varroa, but the beetles, I don't really think they're from this planet. <laughs> I'm very literally that's but I see also them becoming a secondary pest as well, just like wax moths. In medieval times, wax moths used to be very devastating and aggressive and kill hives, but they don't kill hives anymore. They're just a secondary thing. And the beetles are getting to that point. If you see a hive with a lot of beetle problems, they also have, probably also have other stresses in there, like high mite loads and things like that. Beetles can smell the pheromones of the suffering hives and they hone in on those hives specifically. So there, there's a lot of things going on where the beetles are there, and eventually the bees will just be tougher for it. Over here. Hello. Um, you didn't say much about ants. We have a lot of problems in my hives with ants, and, um, and also Sam, do you are you treating for anything, or are you just? No, I treat them nice. <laughs> you did say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I've not done any treatments, and I, my interest in beekeeping is really, I, I want that ability to walk away for a year or two or more and come back and still have some bees in my bee yard. I mean, my beekeeping, you know, like, making money is not my number one priority in, in, in keeping bees. No way. I, I, after a good quality of life, really. I mean, I'm not all the time. It's, it's fantastic. But, you know, I want to keep that sense of wonder of when I'm working with bees. You know, that's really what they, they bring them. And, you know, I, and so I would set up a, a situation where I had very, very little overhead. That's why I build my own hive boxes and kind of eliminate all the inputs that I have to put in there, <coughs> treatments or feed uh, or, or things like that. So I try not to buy anything. I buy honey jars. <laughs> I went back to using mason jars because they're made in America. I buy queen cages because they do sell queens. But, and I buy a lot of gasoline, which is a, a, a bummer. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I think I probably intended to treat my bees when I wanted to expand my numbers, maybe partially to treat them, but I never got, really got around to it. And through breaking the brood cycle, uh, natural combs, and having resistant genetics, I think that really the, uh, you can kind of put things on stable footing, and I never saw a reason to. I wouldn't know how to treat the top of my head. <laughs> Cinnamon. 
and most of the time they come in through the hem cover. Is that where they're coming in at the top of the hive? Um, um, the ants are just launching a huge attack. They are just coming from the bottom, and there might be thousands of them. They're just coming out. Right. Well, if you take brown cinnamon and sprinkle around the base of your hive, one thing is to get it up off the ground. Uh, are you using concrete blocks? Well, this year we changed it over to a plastic um, tabletop that has legs, and uh -huh. we put them in oil cans. And uh, cinnamon didn't really help. We tried that and just ran right through. Really? They did. And um, we have those large uh, carpenter ants that they call them, and they would just be hundreds of them. Okay, so you're talking about carpenter ants. Now, the, the uh, little sugar ants, the cinnamon does work quite well on that. The carpenter ants, this is what I would do if I was you. Find out where they're coming from. Usually they have a nest in a tree or a building or something. And watch for their, their trails. And, and ants usually communicate and they run that same trail. You can take and intercept that trail, dig you out a little bit of a hole take you some boric acid, some uh, sugar, and sweet love, mix it together, put it in that hole, and then take you some 8-inch hardware cloth, kind of make you a teepee, and nail it down with 16 penny nails. The ants will come in, eat the boric acid, the sweet love. I'm not telling you sweet love kills them, but I wouldn't be. <laughs> Another question back here. This might sort of seem like a shameless plug, but do you guys have any packages of nukes available? Or are you sold out? <laughs> I only have top bars and I'll love them like my own. Treating these or not, uh, it got me thinking again about another point I'd like to 
make. Um, if you treat your hives or medicate your bees, it doesn't make you a bad person or a bad beekeeper or my enemy or anything. I'll still be friends with you. It's just fine. Our treatment-free movement it can also create this polarity in the bee world between the us and them mentality, whereas the new beekeepers are starting to think that if you treat your bees, you're evil or wrong or a bad person. That's not the case at all. There's very, very few of us still beekeepers in the world. The bee world is too small to have, to have this inner turmoil. Inner difference. We need elders, we need to all be working together. There's a lot of bigger issues like pesticides and things, clean wars, which we work on. So we need solidarity with people. Don't be afraid to ask a question. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask because you will pay for it. I'm mean, serious. I've seen some plans for a top bar hive that include a hardware cloth or a wire across the bottom. You didn't talk about using mesh uh, or not across the bottom. I don't do it. I've never really seen a screen bottom in a wild hive or anything. And um, since, I mean, my interest is like you know, having bees that survive on their own. I don't do any kind of manipulations or anything to limit my levels or things like that. I might like drop that at all. It uh, didn't really matter to me. And the screen bottoms that we can survive just fine in them as long as you keep draft off of them. And a lot of people do screen bottoms because it helps uh, moisture issues in the hives. Just make sure hives are dry, whatever kind of bottom that you use. Things like that. I have two standard, regular Langsmith hives, and I want to regress them to natural size. Foundation with springs. And I know it takes a long time, like maybe more than a year, of switching out the colors because it takes a long time to learn to build smaller cells. I want to cheat with Honey Supercell. How do you go about that? Okay, um, Honey Supercell is a, um, a full drawn plastic frame. It's actually the whole cone is all plastic. And the bees are pretty much forced to use this full plastic cone. And you have a queen includer in there so they can't abscond it because they hate that plastic. They really do. Uh, but this, by using it, by forcing them to get a rounded root on this plastic, it can make large bees go small instantly. And, but it's tough to get them to use it. You force them to use it, you have to feed them real well, they, they get them to lay brood in it. Um, there's also a man lake frame called a PF120, I believe, that is a plastic 4.9 foundation, it's like 4.95. And we've been finding that, that the bees can often draw that pretty well, or, or right when you should take large bees and shake them onto that 4.95 plastic stuff. And that's um, something that's recommended in the, like, the Complete Idiots Guide to Beekeeping and things like that. The super cell is pretty bulky and expensive. And, if you they winter too well on um, that in, in the north. I mean, you can get around to that through and then out of the hive. But you know, I've often seen bees living on large cell, even plastic frames survive year after year because they're allowed to swarm. You can just stack them up and they can just go once a year. But the swarming process really takes the edge off. Or if you can go in there and break up the brood cycle while you're regressing your bees. I mean, the full on bees were really small. I still saw like lots of mites and, and, and saw problems so, from them. That, but by breaking the brood cycle, it's going to buy you time while the bees are getting smaller, or just you know, take the edge off while they find their own balance of they, where they want to be. And if you use the price to sell, um, that, um, on the super sale, if you'll take and put them on there, coat it with some sugar water, that takes it a little better, it's plastic, they don't like it. I haven't seen any plastic in the beach. Yet. <laughs> and but you're you're only gonna have it in that hive for six to eight weeks. I don't recommend keeping them in there permanently. Once you get that colony converted over to the four point nine, you can pull them out, just have a foundation in there, one frame at a time, and then it'll start drawing them down. You know, before a night's drop. But remember that six to eight weeks we're up here in the north. But, and we have a short season and but I mean you can Use it and get it out the same season, but you probably uh, just use a lot of feed. Make sure the bees are well nourished so they can survive the winter. Yeah, and that's that's right. If you because some of the stuff I tell you is based on where I live, so always take that in consideration. Because there's a lot of books out there, a lot of knowledge, but it's based on what that individual has experienced. And so, thank you for bringing that up because I keep forgetting. You know, y'all do have a much. Uh, so it's, it's all together different volume. 
I had a question about the top bar hives. Um, you had said you put popsicle sticks in that groove. Um, is there a specific type of glue that you should use, like Elmer's glue or anything like that? I just use Elmer's glue or wood glue. I okay. never use beeswax, but I don't have a beeswax. Uh, some people use strips of foundation in there. Some people like, have like, molding or a triangle right, that they build off of. You know, it, it all works. Um, I'm new at, at beekeeping, and I, I just heard something about zombie bees. Um, they, um, I don't know if it's a virus or something, but apparently they get a chance to fly tonight and they fly away. Um, I didn't see it in this, but the other truth is, is, is this something new? Um, I don't know, set the set of lab yet. To me, that's a natural uh, flat. It's native to the United States. Well, before it flies. Yeah, it's, it, it's always been here, but like, it's just one more yeah. sensationalized story that the media's picked up about like, causing bees to kind of leave their hives at night and stuff like that. It's almost just like the cell phone story. They get really popular. Oh, the cell phones are killing the bees. And there's really, it's never been a study done that says cell phones kill bees. But it became this national phenomenon story because I think the, the people are just looking for a reason to get rid of their cell phones. Then too, it takes pressure. If they can find something else to point the finger to, it takes pressure off the pesticide companies. That's the real problem. Mm -hmm. Is the pesticide? They've outlawed it in six, eight countries over in Europe. Yeah, the number one chemical in the world is a mycoprid right now. It's more popular than Roundup. We've had lawsuits against Bayer Crop Science. The EPA was just caught last year for fudging the data to get the stuff approved. And the mycoprid, both ionide and are using all corn, soy. And I just keep my bees away from that stuff these days. It's, uh, it's not a good deal. And these are systemic, so these don't really forage regularly on comb. But the way the systemics work, they go into every part of the plant. They go into the groundwater of these agricultural fields. And they get picked up by the wildflowers on the outskirts. And it's a bad deal. So, what you gotta do? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you have a question, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Hang on one second. We'll get to it. All right, then pass it. I have two questions. One could be a very big question, but um, because the two of you are standing there together, I wonder how you might compare on feeding. Um, and that ties into a second question, which I think uh, here in Philadelphia we've been talking about getting bees that are locally adapted. Um, and the second question is, with all this crazy weather, can we ever expect the bees to kind of figure out what the weather's supposed to be? Um, a lot of hives, I think, here in Philadelphia, at least we've heard of a few, and probably many times more, have died out this winter because there have been so many warm periods during the winter. So feeding and not feeding, partly is that so the bees can get adapted to the when the flow is and when the flow isn't. It breaks the, uh, the root cycle. I don't know, maybe each one of you could sort of elaborate on that and add any thoughts about getting bees to be adapted. Well, uh, I really recommend stay away from Italian bees. They, 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 
by purchasing these, because these bees are bred, like I was talking about, to serve migratory pollination interests. And they turn, tend to turn all their honey into more brood okay, and more bees all the time. And they can't break their cluster in the winter to move around to, to get the honey, things like that. The darker bees seem to fare a lot better and a lot closer to our interests have a couple hives in the backyard. And uh, uh, so that's one of the things. And uh, uh, what else did you mention? The crazy weather. Yeah, no. the Russian bees seem to make honey through the winter. I don't know. <laughs> they eat very little and stuff. But uh, one of the great things you can do as a club, since you have a lot of sources for bees, I mean, already, what people, what is working for people, you can share some of these genetics around and do some queen learning programs together. These genetics, and uh, see what's working. For some people. Yeah, I think about uh, getting a local group together trying different genetics and get their own queen uh, marrying going. It, there's so much business out there now. This is unreal. I've never seen beekeeping like it is today. It's just it's exploding. You think the way the economy is that it'd be some sort of slowdown. Uh, we can't, as I was saying, we can't stamp them out fast enough. And uh, so it, it would be a good thing to have a club to, to take and do that. Uh, if it's an ideal world, you wouldn't have to feed the bees. And our, our take on it is you get that colony well established the first year because it takes so much resources to dry out the wax. You get them established, then the next year, you let them go through the dirt. What, what? They're on their own. You know, that's our philosophy. We help you. It's like uh, we help you teach you to fish, but after that you're going to catch your own. And, and they're they're put out there. And they don't feed our bees every year. It's just starting starting the pack. You just get that wax drop. And, and it really can take years for a hive to reach honey producing strength. You know, so feeding them well in their, at least their first season to, to get them to that point. And at that point, my program is to just like either they cut it or they don't. You know, they got to feed themselves, but. You know, getting it through, I mean, trying to feed in the winter is very problematic because it causes moisture problems in the hive, people do find it. But it's pretty much all about prevention and we're keeping it from happening. Over here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a new beekeeper this spring, and my question is, how do you hang with the queens? Is there, just, is there a way that each of you would recommend? Do you do it with a string? Do you do it with a piece of wire you can pull out? Is there something that works better or worse? Well, in, if you're doing it on the top bar hive, uh, you don't want to hang the queen in between two of these bars from a string because they'll probably start making wax right off of that queen cage and it'll be off centered and just crazy right from the get go and you'll have a mess right from the start. So if it's, if it's warm out, you can put the queen cage right on the bottom, like we're talking about, but if it's cold, uh, you want to make sure that she can be in the cluster. You can uh, uh, hammer a nail into the side of the box or just hang the queen cage on the nail. That. Some people direct them to release their queens, but in a top bar hive to get them going, you know, if it's a, a hive from scratch, you, know, you want to do some things that make the bees like it, you know, rub some wax in there, leave the queen in the cage for a day or two while they get used to it, make it smell like a beehive, definitely feed them something, and uh, you know, maybe a little bit of lemongrass oil in there. Also give them a good amount of space, because when a swarm goes out and looks for a cavity, they're looking for a pretty big sized cavity. I mean, your package should be Clusters only might be this big, people think they can shape them up to five bars. But they, the bees might have scum because they think it's too small. You can give them a good 12, 15 bars in there, and you can always condense them back down if you want to like, conserve their bees. And that's one of my recommendations. And you can hang out for the next day or two to keep the bees from sconding. If they were catching as they make a break for it, you can get to you know, you need some comb or something like that to get in there. Get a bit of now, on a line straw, the uh, way we do it, we take the two, two frames, pull them, pull them apart, and lay the queen cage with the screen down, facing down like this in between the frames. It's actually in between the frame. And of course, you pull the cork in with candy so the bees can eat her out. And we're talking about package bees. If you have a established colony and you want to have good acceptance of a queen that you had brought in, leave that cork in there for two days. Because the bees got that three-day memory. 
come out there on the second end of the second day, pull that cork out, they'll eat her out. So that gives them a total of five days to get used to that. It usually takes about three days to eat the candy out. And you put that in there like that, and then we take a stapler, hit this corner here, and here, and here, you have four staples holding it. Whereas if you dangle it in between the frames, they're going to make some wax because they'll build off. Like you're talking about, Sam was talking about, they'll build off and you'll have a mess. And so if they do build off the cut on the, uh, the clean case, it's going to be out of the way. And it's usually if you don't get back into it quick enough, they will start pulling from that clean case and go down. So if they do, it's no big deal. The trick of it is go back in there in about seven days, six, seven days, check it, make sure the queen's released, remove the cake. We learned this stuff the hard way. Yeah. That's some back here. I was talking about the box, uh, uh, moving bees and cardboard moves. I mean, I was so excited when, when we got our first uh, batch of cardboard moves. I said, man, we won't have to make any more moves. I even tried raising them in. And that was a mistake. <laughs> and uh, I talked to Don. He did tell you. Uh, I took some down there at Don Coopermeister at that big man. And, and uh, because of <coughs> him, I was going to uh, start a bunch of news down there. And uh, we swapped genetics back and forth. And I set those boxes up. And Don just politely just shook his head. You're going to pay the tax. <laughs> Cardboard and it's coated with wax. We sweat it. I mean, it was pitiful. I, I never used it again. <laughs> Got some questions back here? I'm just curious how you guys make up the news. Um, I tried last year and had problems with small high beams taking them over. So I was wondering, like, how many frames of bees you put in a new? We tend to keep it stronger, you know. Um, for, for several reasons, we like to keep them stronger. I do these in Florida too, where we have a lot of small high beetles. They live out in the woods, and the time's right, just come and get the bees. But uh, we keep your nukes strong. If you're keeping uh, your, your nukes, you're split in the same yard, all of your old bees are going to fly back to the parent hive uh, that you pull them out of. So you want to give them, even, it doesn't really matter how much brood you give them, but you want to have lots of extra bees that are going to cover the brood and protect the brood. So, I mean, it depends on time of year how strong you want to make it. It also depends on how you're going to winter them. Uh, Kirk Webster and Michael Palmer up in Vermont have done a, a lot of work wintering small nukes. They uh, designed a feeder that works with a divider in their 10 frame box. It takes the place of two frames. They have two four frame nukes that heat each other. They have that critical mass where there's a queen on each side and they keep each other warm through the winter. So they can start those even up until the start of August in Vermont with like maybe one or two frames of brood, and uh, they feed them really well, though. The smaller the hive, the more coddling it needs. So I, I built up my business following Kirk Webster's methods, pretty much. Uh, like, he's got three parts of his apiary. He has his honey producers, which are large hives in winters. He's got hives that he raises just to split into lots of nukes, and which are these very small nukes, and then his queen rearing nukes and his queen rearing operation. And uh, I was able to expand uh, my numbers very quickly by grafting and wintering small nukes. But I realized that it was a heck of a lot of work to get these small hives through. They all need to be fed really well uh, because they don't have that population where they can feed themselves when they're that small. And also I realized in my hives, since I wasn't saving cone, I could get a little top bar nuke through to winch it. Then I didn't have any cones to give them when they really wanted to take off. They had to make all their own wax. And would take them, you know, well into the summer until they got to a size that I could split them again and maybe into three nukes and try to get those three nukes through the winter. And so I wasn't really expanding all, all of that quickly. And I started doing more packaged bees and wintering my hives on a larger size and then just pulling swarms out of them rather than doing so much manipulation. Also, I was, you know, I, I sell nukes out of a top bar hive, so I'm going to pull uh, five cones out of there, which five cones do I take? Do I take from here, there, they're all different and all weird. So that, that's a, a factor as well, as well. And also, if you're expanding your, your, your bee operation, and you want to be a bee provider and, and hook up your friends and things like that, rather than selling your cones or giving your cones away when you give a nuke, you can just shake bees into your friend's box. And with the, give them a queen and shake some bees and simulate a swarm. That way you're not losing your cones every year. 
you'd be able to make more honey and your bees will recover faster if they don't have to rebuild that wax. So a little bit of both. I mean, uh, you know, I do still winter some smaller hives, but I some of the large hives and, and split them by just pulling out these the swarms. Well, the way we do it, we look to, to uh, nature, which is what we're talking about uh, as far as the individual is concerned, not, not making splits or um, commercial applications like that. But if you look to nature, look at the pine trees. When you see the pine trees in the spring put forth a new growth, a candle on the end, that's the idea of time because you have everything you need. You have the nectar, the natural nectar, you have the pollen, and you have the heat. The three things bees have to have to expand the colony. And we'll take and, and pull a frame of capped honey, a frame of pollen, and three frames of brood at various stages of development. If you're going to raise your own queen from that, a particular colony, you want to make sure you have a frame of fresh eggs. Because you want them still standing straight up. And then put that in. At that time, you have enough drones in the wild for that new maybe queen or the queen to make with. And we take and put them in a box, and we set an empty box on the top. And like uh, Sam was saying, <coughs> we pull some frames, make sure the whole queen's not on there, and shake it. About five or six frames of bees on top of that. And at night, two thirds of those bees are going to leave from that colony and go for late evening and go back to the original colony because they're field bees. They got it imprinted on their little brains to go back to where they came from. Mm -hmm. Where these others are nurse bees, and they haven't had the opportunity to fly out to get that imprinted on their brain where they belong, so they will take care of all the brood that's part of their duties at the stage of life. And by dumping those extra five, six frames, you have enough heat for the colony to expand and can grow and enough bees in there. And that's, that's the way we work. I'm talking specifically about the beetle pressure and taking out nukes. Um, there's a lot of different ways to make splits and make nukes. And some people will just pull out some frames of eggs put the eggs in the new spot, in a small nuke, and let that small nuke raise their own queen. And that, that, that can be a viable program, but the beetles have, have uh, really uh, compromised that kind of method, you know, because uh, they can really, a uh, hive uh, without a queen, you know, is undergoing stress, and the beetles hone in on the stress, they can smell it, they're attracted to it. So if you have a tiny hive that is going under the stress, you know, they're really susceptible to the adult beetles show up. Whereas if that tiny hive has the queen, and brooder that's emerging is going to just reset itself and expand. You won't have as many people showing up. Okay, we have one more back here, one up front, and then Dave will be our last question. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Sam. You mentioned you sort of got interested in bees reading about permaculture. Uh, I'm wondering if you do anything specifically with bees at your place with permaculture, or if you have any ideas how they could be used in systems like that. Um, I, I just met uh, Phil Forsyth who runs the Philadelphia Orchard Project here. And if anyone needs a spot to put bees, the Philadelphia Orchard Project is, does inner city permaculture, uh, perennial gardening and forest gardening. And they're always looking for bees because bees are, uh, they need the pollination as, as well. But um, I'm, yeah, I'm always excited to have bees in permaculture areas because bees are a real integral part of agriculture. I mean, they're utmostly important to it, but they're really at odds with agriculture, any kind of agriculture, any kind of row farming be it organic or not, because organic, uh, certified organic farms can still use some pretty uh, invasive practices, some heavy metals, and that slime is that systemic stuff that, to kill flea beetles that's really not good for bees in some organic farming. But uh, and, you know, you know, bees thrive on the, this wild, these wild areas, or the, these are robust you know, furrows, and you know, bee-friendly farming is going to be the wave of the future. So, um, yeah, I definitely got uh, inspired to keep bees by reading the permaculture books, the big designer's manuals, like this Bible of sustainable ag design. I was leaping through the pages, and they have this little drawing in there, this PVC structure that they were making. And these field mice would go into these PVC structures and actually store their wild grains and rices in there. People are harvesting the grains from the field mice. As long as they didn't take them all, the mice would keep doing it. And it blew my mind. And this little penny this little cute mouse running in there. Wow. Now that's a totally different approach to what you guys see in farming before. So 
Yeah, and uh, I, it's really interesting permaculture before it got really like hip and trendy like it is now, but it's really neat to see these certification courses and a lot of education of the, the way we're going to be growing food in the future. So a lot of my friends run CSAs and, and things like, especially in the Hudson Valley, New York, there's dozens of brand new CSAs, community-supported agriculture, models of feeding people and getting community support, but really, these, these kids are, are working so, so hard just to grow rows of European vegetables, like standard fare and stuff, or just, you know, see like alternative uh, models of income, doing education, this more perennial farming, with a lot less inputs than that, it's a lot easier to grow food in other ways. So, um, yeah, we using permaculture are pretty amazing. So they go hand in hand. I work on a lot of permaculture farms, we do a lot of events. Along the same lines, I was wondering, do you have particular plants that you like to establish for forage during certain times of the year where the nectar flow is quite minimal? Uh, no. We're talking about my area here, so I, I can't tell you what it's over here. We plant a white and a yellow clover. It gets up about, about this high, and it's a a natural uh, clover, a honey producing plant, and the bees really love it. And a lot of farmers don't particularly care for it because it drops seeds on the second year. And uh, it's not invasive or anything, but it will, it's clover, and you know how clover gets in the yard. And so a lot of the beekeepers down our way, they'll wait. Uh, now, in our area, we're talking about February 15th to March. 15 is the ideal time to sow clover or grass seed. And usually about that time we catch a snow. And so if you can walk alongside the road, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll have a lot of farm. Yeah, a lot of clover. And uh, of course I do it in my field, so I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but, but planting it, y'all probably, what, two months behind us? A month and a half or something like that. So you'd have to make that adjustment. And that uh, clover seed is pulled down in by the melting snow, and man, it, it takes off. But your ground has to have a certain amount of uh, lime in it for, for it to, to stay year after year for it to be limed for the pH. Well, we know that bees can forage in a six mile radius, or even more than that, they cover 70,000 some acres. Around that, with one hive, we'll, we'll do that if they have to. They're really efficient within a mile or two and pollinate everything. We also know it takes millions of flowers to make a pound of honey. Lots of flowers. And, uh, a lot of good beekeepers say, oh, well, I didn't mow the front, front yard, so they have something to eat. <laughs> they, they might have some interest in there, and of course, if we all aren't mowing our front lawns and had this you know, ecological wasteland of this perfect green lawn, we would have a much better world for our bees, of course. But um, I do have some of, of uh, my farmers who want to plant for the bees specifically. And, uh, and they're looking for cover crops and things like that. So buckwheat is an excellent one, and it's a six-week turnaround for planting in bloom time. And you can plant an acre or half acre or any amount of buckwheat. I usually tell them to plant it in mid to late June, because then it'll bloom you know, sometime by the start of August. And up in New York, we have a, a dearth in nectar in some areas between the clover and the golden uh, through August. Lots of things you can plant. Hyssops, forage, any kind of mints or sages. Um, yeah, yeah, you can benefit from it all. <coughs>
So if just regressing them is not, it might not solve uh, all the problems and keep them safe. But uh, that being said, I mean, anything you could do, and I, I tell people they really want to buy some bees, get any bees that are available. So you just get some bees, and whether you use the, you force them to be smaller or let them grow natural cones, doesn't matter. You just give them a chance to, to reach this healing process. And the healing process for the bees is the same as the healing process for the beekeeper. It's really great to uh, get, watch them get healthier and reach their balance. So, I mean, I did try some natural combs with some commercial packages, and that, that you know, some of them pull it off. So it's like, yeah, you know, they do whatever they can. Just do lots of it. <laughs> so, just one last thank you to these guys. Thank <laughs> you.